F.W. de Klerk, the former president of South Africa who died this week at the age of 85, will be remembered by many for his political courage in dismantling apartheid. But he will also be remembered for his earlier support of and belief in the racial segregationist system. So how did the last president of apartheid South Africa see his role in changing the destiny of his country? Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. As South Africa bids farewell this week to the man who helped the country transition from the segregationist apartheid system to majority rule, the legacy of President F.W. de Klerk and the role he played in ending white minority rule in his country has come under renewed scrutiny. While many South Africans accuse him of not having done enough to denounce apartheid as a crime against humanity and make amends for a system he once believed in and even incarnated, the current president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, said of de Klerk's passing that it should be a moment to, quote, inspire all of us to reflect on the birth of our democracy. In a message released on Thursday, a day after he lost his struggle against mesothelioma, a visibly weakened de Klerk offered his final declaration in an emotional plea. Let me today, in this last message, repeat, I without qualification, apologize for the pain and the hurt and the indignity and the damage that apartheid has done to black, brown and Indians in South Africa. As South Africa continues to grapple with the legacy of a brutal apartheid regime three decades after it came to an end, the debate over F.W. de Klerk's central role in ending the system of white minority rule, which lasted from 1948 to 1994, will continue. I sat down with President de Klerk in one of his last international public appearances in December 2019. But first, a short retrospective of his life. Frederick William de Klerk was born on 18 March 1936 in Johannesburg to an Afrikaner family with a long political history in the National Party, which was in power during the apartheid era. In 1948, when F.W. de Klerk was 12, the apartheid system was officially institutionalized with his father playing a significant role. De Klerk graduated in 1958 with a law degree before entering politics in the early 1970s. He held several ministerial posts, including Minister of Home Affairs under P.W. Botha, before succeeding him as leader of the National Party. I, Frederick Willem de Klerk, do swear to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. Soon after becoming president in 1989, he authorized secret talks in Geneva between his intelligence services and exiled ANC leaders Thabo Mbeki and Jacob Zuma. He also visited Nelson Mandela in prison later that year to discuss the possibility of ending white rule. The prohibition of the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and a number of subsidiary organizations is being rescinded. By February 1990, he had introduced radical political reforms in Parliament, legalized the African National Congress and the Communist Party of South Africa, and freed major political opponents, including Mandela. He enacted legislation to repeal the legal framework of apartheid. He also ordered the termination of the country's nuclear weapons program. In 1992, de Klerk held a white-only referendum on ending apartheid, which gave him an overwhelming mandate to pursue negotiations to end apartheid. He was, however, suspected by the ANC and others of enabling violence. In December 1993, de Klerk and Mandela were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. South Africa held its first universal suffrage elections in April 1994, Nelson Mandela became the first post-apartheid president and de Klerk his vice president. De Klerk's opposition to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission established in 1995 to bring closure to the crimes perpetrated under apartheid and his unwillingness to accept the United Nations' definition of the crime of apartheid as a crime against humanity were criticized at the time and will remain part of his legacy. While F.W. de Klerk was hailed by most South Africans, he was considered a traitor by a white supremacist minority. Celebrated or loathed, F.W. de Klerk is a statesman whose mark on the history of the 20th century is here to stay. 
and whose legacy will be studied and debated with possibly no definitive answer. Here now my conversation with President de Klerk at the World Mind Symposium in Zurich, Switzerland, before a global audience of policy and business leaders, as well as scientists and innovators, a very personal and personable discussion, a conversation that provides a rare insight into F.W. de Klerk and his relationship with President Nelson Mandela. Now, President de Klerk, I did have the privilege and the very rare privilege and pleasure to sit down with you a few days ago, a few years ago, I should say, and in fact, yesterday as well. But a few years ago, you and I couldn't remember which year it was. It was actually 2009 in Warsaw at the Nobel Peace Prize laureates meeting, the opening session, which I had uh, the pleasure to, to moderate. Let me take you back 30 years back, South Africa. The date was 11 February. No, you, 11 you, you February 1990. 1990. 1990. That was a historic day. That was when you decided to set free Nelson Mandela. He told you he felt it was a bit too soon, which is an interesting remark for him to say after 27 years in captivity. Can you tell us exactly why you took that decision? What made you do it? Uh, and whether you ever second-guessed yourself or even regretted it? Thank you. Can I say it's nice to share the platform with you again? Uh, actually, the most important part of what happened in February 1990 was the speech I made when I opened Parliament on the 2nd of February 1990, where I already announced in principle the release of Mr. Mandela. But in that speech, I've put together a package which, could rem which would remove and was designed to remove each and every objection the African National Congress could have not to come and sit down around the table and negotiate with us a new dispensation. It included the release of all political prisoners. It included the lifting of the state of emergency. Most importantly, it included the unbanning of the African National Congress, of the SA Communist Party, even of the armed wing of the African National Congress, Unkontwe, where she's with. And for that, you got more heat from all, some of the white Afrikaners than for the release of Mandela himself. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, they were flabbergasted. But I've come to this conclusion that we need to take these bold steps. Before I became president, I became president in September 1989. But before then, the ruling National Party which established apartheid originally as a policy, had deep self-analysis process through which we put ourselves. And we reached the conclusion that we have to admit that we have failed through separate development, through the establishment of so many nation states to bring justice to all, and that we could not build the future of our own people on the basis of continued injustice, we had to admit apartheid was wrong. But did you admit apartheid was wrong based on the moral principles behind it, or was it dictated to a large extent by the economic reality? Let's face it, South Africa was under sanctions. You were losing quite considerably around the world, moral support and economic. True, sanctions, sanctions played a role. Mm. But I can honestly testify that the whole process was conscience-driven. It was the admission that we cannot build the future of South Africa on the basis any longer of separation, that we had to make a 180-degree turn if we want to bring justice to all. For you, it was a way to protect and salvage South Africa for the, the white community as well, not yes. quite the way they, many of them saw it. If we didn't do what we did, there would have been a catastrophe in South Africa. We could have looked like Syria today. But today, looking back, do you feel that you've done, uh, you've made enough headway? I, I was in South Africa, in Cape Town, in fact, your hometown, just last September, and I was struck by the level of structural injustice that still seems to permeate society, largely affecting the black community. I think apartheid can be blamed for some of it, but not for all of it. Fact is, we've also had a number of years, especially the last 10 years, of very bad governance. 
What President Mandela, when he became president, inherited was a stable economy, although suffering because of sanctions. But sanctions were immediately lifted. All the doors throughout the international community opened for South Africa. We had a wonderful opportunity. In the early 2000s, we achieved a growth rate of more than 5% in real terms per annum. Today, it's comma six. That's not due to apartheid. That's due to bad governance, to policy uncertainty, to far-left socialist tendencies within the ruling party, uh, with too much power to the trade unions. All those factors contribute to the bad present financial situation. Corrupt uh, practices by some political leaders who succeeded you, Jacob Zuma, uh, having been indicted on corruption charges and money laundering just last March. What does it take to have uh, leaders like you uh, uh, and Nelson Mandela? And, and the story goes in the press that the two of you really didn't get on very well. Is that true? I didn't get your question clearly. Uh, if r rumor has it. <laughs> I say, what does it take to have leaders like you today? Because ah. you seem to be the abnormality, shall we say. What does it take to have the kind of political courage that is needed to make peace in some parts of the world. And I just wondered if you could uh, speak to the rumors that I used to circulate about you and Mandela not being on good terms. I think leadership, and what he and I share, mm. leadership is not about giving people what the opinion polls say they want. Leadership is having a vision, mm. is having action plans to ensure that that vision can be implemented and then convincing your support base, your constituency, that this will be best for them. This is what I had to do with white South Africans. And this is what Mr. Mandela had to deal with, do with his own party. The end result of our negotiations did not please fully his own people. They say he made too many compromises. He did not please my people fully. They said I made too many compromises, but it was a good new constitution that we negotiated, and it was our joint will and conviction that unless we do this, there would be a catastrophe in South Africa. You made your political moral calculations, and you also both decided it was a risk worth taking. Uh, what would you say about Mandela that struck you about him as a leader, besides the fact that you say he was a very good listener, and both of you being lawyers, being good listeners? He's a, he was a very special man. He is a man of, was a man of great integrity. He always kept his word. He was analytical in his thinking, as I've tried to be also throughout my life. And we clicked because we were lawyers, as you say, and because both of us are also good listeners and don't, didn't interrupt each other right from the beginning, we built this mutual feeling, I can do business with this man. So you weren't mortal enemies, as some journalists used to like to say. At some times, we were bashing head on, yes. At which point did you realize that he was more of a friend than a foe? I would say nearer to our uh, joint retirement. We retired quite near to each other. <laughs> and in retirement, we really became good friends. We uh, had lunches and dinners together. We phoned each other regularly. And we really became almost friends in the real sense of You say that. almost friends, that yet this is what he said about you. He apparently said, my worst nightmare is to wake up one morning and he, you, is not here. <laughs> Did he say this to you, or did you just read about it? He didn't this? say it to me in so many words, but he did, he did, against the wishes of his own party, give credit to the role that I and my party played. And he was, he was very sort of magnanimous in doing so publicly on a regular basis. Not easy for you to have convinced the ruling white minority who had clung to power for decades that they should now abandon that power, not as a sign of surrender in the way you saw it, but for survival and conversion. Your life was at risk sometimes, yet it was worth taking that risk. Absolutely. There were great risks. And at one point in the negotiations, in the, around about the beginning of the end of 1991, the tide 
in, amongst the white electorate turned against me. And I was under pressure from the far right white opposition party to call an election and say I no longer had a mandate for what I was doing. Yeah. I then took the big risk of calling a referendum, yeah. posing the question, you now know where we're going, because it was quite transparent, the negotiations. Must I go ahead, yes or no? And you got a resounding 69% yes. 69,9% voted yes in favor, and that reinvigorated my mandate, and I could move ahead and sign deals. And you got that result on your birthday. I got that, <laughs> that absolutely. It was the biggest birthday presents I ever got. Definitely a memorable one. Uh, when you look uh, at Robben Island, we all know Robben Island. I, I actually went and visited Robben Island just a few months ago, as I say, and saw that cell in which Mandela was kept. You, I believe from your garden, actually see Robben Island. What goes through your mind? Well, just a footnote. Mm. He, d he wasn't kept in that cell. For 27 years. But for, for 18, his full I term. Yeah. Uh, in the last years, he was housed in a proper little uh, flat almost. He had a TV and he had a butler serving him, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He was treated as a very important prisoner. Right. But he did spend but a number of years there. He did spend a number of years in that cell. Yeah. The tragedy of it all was that a man like he was kept in prison for so long. Mm. Uh, he was nonetheless so strong in his commitment towards a peaceful solution that he showed a remarkable lack of bitterness, notwithstanding what he had to undergo. He came forward and proved through deeds and words that he was not bitter about it at all, that he felt he did what he did he served the sentence that he served for the sake of a better South Africa for all its people. And it took not just him, but your vision and wisdom and political courage as well. As a Nobel Peace Prize winner, today when you look at the state of the world and the few places and hotspots around the world that desperately need a Mandela and an F.W. de Klerk, is there a place that you think you could actually you know, transplant yourself or some of your wisdom and give advice? That's what we try to do in the Global Leadership Foundation. I've brought together 46 former presidents, prime ministers, cabinet ministers, senior diplomats. And when we engage with a country, we don't charge fees, we're a non-profit organization. When we engage a country, we make a small team of three or four of us who can rely on our own experiences, who learned from our own mistakes where we burnt our fingers and sit down with the president of a country in the developing world mm. and help to guide him or her what initiatives can they take to make things better in their country. How often are they willing to listen, though? Well, at the moment, we engage to seven, with seven countries at the same time. Mm. So it's an idea which is working in practice. Some of them listen well and implement, and we let them get, take the credit for good things they do we stay out of the spotlight. Some of them listen and don't accept the advice, <laughs> and things don't get better in their country. If you were to give one piece of free yet public advice to, say, President um, Trump, <laughs> what would you advise him? <laughs> I don't think he is the type of person who will easily listen to good advice. <laughs> He listens to his own advice. <laughs> but my advice to him would be, yes, to do the right things to promote America's interest. There's nothing wrong with a president saying, I put my country first. Mm. I don't have any objection against that. But to acknowledge also the leading role which America has to play in the global situation and not to abdicate from that role. Even though some might say less interference is better. Yeah, interference from America was always very irritating, also for us in South Africa. I'm not pleading for interference. I'm pleading for moral leadership and for support for what is right wherever it happens. Talking about the United States, uh, his predecessor, 
also won the Nobel Peace Prize. In fact, when we met, uh, President Obama had just been in office less than a year. He had already won the Nobel Peace Prize. I remember asking you on stage, did you think he deserved it yet for not having done very much? Um, I won't ask you today. You didn't answer the question back then. You're free to answer it today. But do you think that the Nobel Committee sometimes gives the award to the wrong people? I think the Nobel Committee has a policy that they sometimes award it to support a process which is taking place. In our case, we haven't completed our negotiations. We were very near to completion. They gave it to Mr. Mandela and me also to encourage us to continue and finish what we started. I do think they gave it to President Obama a bit too soon. A bit too soon. You think he deserved it at the end of the, the, the two terms? I think uh, uh, I'll pass on that. OK. <laughs> I knew you might, but I thought I'd try anyway. <laughs> Speaking of encouragement, though, do you think they might have um, missed an opportunity by not encouraging the new young generation that's galvanizing public opinion on climate change? I'm thinking Greta Thunberg. Sh should she have been awarded the Nobel Prize, or was it too soon? I think the person to whom they gave it now thoroughly also deserved it. So yes, there was strong competition for it. But she has many years ahead. She can still carry on with her job and get the recognition next year or the year after. Right, they gave it to the leader of e Ethiopia. Looking ahead, President uh, de Klerk, what is there in life that you haven't done that yet that you'd love to do? Is there a next uh, new project for you? Well, I'm 83 years old, so my time is limited for next new projects. Now, I would like to make sure that the projects I've started, my two foundations, the F.W. de Klerk Foundation in South Africa, which supports the Constitution, the Global Leadership Foundation, about which I've already spoken, to continue and to grow beyond my own time. Mm. Because both of them are focused on things which are very necessary, which can make the world a better place, which can ensure that South Africa do not, does not lo lose its way and can be brought back, because we have lost our way somewhat, can be brought back to the right track. So I'm dedicated for the rest of my life, apart from dedicated to my wife and my family, I'm dedicated to these two projects, not to let them wane in any way, but to get them to grow and to intensify their activity. And it's so wonderful to see you being so active on the international uh, stage, sharing your wisdom with so many people around the world. Just finally in the two minutes that we've got left, bringing it back full circle, going back to the early days and looking forward in terms of South Africa and the wider African region. Back to you and a little bit to, to Mandela. Uh, I know that you used to write on a daily basis for a while letters to Nelson Mandela telling him about the state of the country, the state of the world, 19 letters, in fact, that were published in a book. So if you were to write one more letter, how optimistic might it be? I would lament in my letter about the present state of affairs in South Africa. And I would write to him and say, it's time that the values for which we stood and which we succeeded in encapsulating in one of the best constitutions in the world should be revived again and should be actively advocated and should become again the light ahead in the road for South Africa, the ideal to strive for, and that we should use our collective experience to help South Africa to do the right thing again to do the right thing on this wonderful note. And I wish some of the scientists here in the audience today might have helped us find a way to stop the clock. <laughs> Not yet, though. I would have loved to continue the conversation, but thank you so very much indeed. As President de Klerk himself observed in the interview, leadership is fundamentally having a vision and implementing it. And that he did, demonstrating political courage by pushing forward with his vision once he came to the conclusion that apartheid a political system he was raised in and grew to believe in was untenable and immoral. 
whether it was the intrinsic abjection and immorality of apartheid or merely the unsustainability of a regime ready to implode under domestic and international pressure that led de Klerk to dismantle apartheid is hard to establish. Every South African and all of us beyond South Africa will have to draw our own conclusions. Most likely, de Klerk's reasoning was following a political track and vision as well as a moral one, which at some point must have dovetailed. Whatever it is, de Klerk's historical role and significance is beyond doubt. What is also beyond doubt is that it is the combined political wisdoms and skills of both F.W. de Klerk and Nelson Mandela that brought to its logical conclusion the long and bloody struggle against apartheid led by the vast majority of South Africans and many others. Time will tell whether President F.W. de Klerk's last video message, recorded as he was facing his own mortality, will be enough to convince many of his repentance. That's all from me, Rida Fakhri. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.